Hey, it's Professor Dave. Let's talk about IR spectroscopy. He knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. So a lot of times when we do chemistry, we face a very big challenge, and that is that we cannot see molecules. So we might do some chemical reaction, get a product, and we need some way to be sure that what we got is what we think it is, because we can't see them. We can't see what the structure of the molecule is. So we have, an, uh, we have a number of techniques uh, that fall under the umbrella term of spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the uh, study of the interaction of light and matter. And so there's a lot of forms of spectroscopy that we can use to gather data about what the structure of a molecule might be. And so right now we're going to look at IR spectroscopy. IR stands for infrared, as in infrared light. So what we're going to do is Say we do a reaction, we have some molecule, we want to figure out what the molecule is. We, we, we uh, irradiate a sample with infrared, infrared light. Uh, that light is going to interact in some way with the, with the compounds in the sample. And then it will eventually reach a detector. So uh, some light will be absorbed by the sample, some will not, some will pass through. And this is information that we can use to figure out something about the structure of the molecule. The reason that we use infrared light is because different molecules, we, know, we already know that molecules uh, move around, they have translational motion, right? We know that uh, heat energy is converted into kinetic energy of motion, so molecules, let's say in a gas or even in a liquid, are, are, are moving around uh, with respect to one another. And through conformational analysis, we also know that bonds are rotating all the time. So there, there is rotational motion uh, for all of, the, uh, all of the sigma bonds. But chemical bonds are also doing other things as it happens. They can do these other things that, that occur specifically when they are irradiated with a very specific wavelength of infrared light. They can do something like a symmetric or an asymmetric stretch. So let's say my body is the central atom and these are two uh, atoms that it is bound to. And so my arms are covalent bonds. And so this would be a symmetric stretch. The covalent bonds can actually be contracting and expanding uh, with, uh, at a particular vibration depending on whether it has absorbed this particular photon of UV light. So this is a symmetric stretch. This would be an asymmetric stretch. Okay? And we can also have a symmetric bend or an asymmetric bend in plane. So that would look like this. This would be symmetric or we could have asymmetric. And we can actually have uh, twisting. We can have it like this which would be symmetric or it would be, I can't even do it, it's very difficult to do. But the point is we have all of these different kinds of uh, vibrational motions happening in a molecule and they occur at very particular uh, uh, energies. So they will occur when a uh, wavelength of uh, a very specific infrared light is absorbed and it will vary depending on the functional group. So the identity of these atoms will, will affect the photon of absorption. So this is information that we're going to use to generate an IR spectrum. So let's look at what that looks like right now. Okay, so what I've done here is I've drawn a sample IR spectrum. So let's take a look at what these look like and, and uh, try to understand what we can use them for. So let's look at the axes. First, on the bottom here, we have the wave number. The wave number is telling us about the very particular energy of infrared light. So we, infrared light is a certain band, right? It's a certain part of the electromagnetic spectrum all the way from this wavelength to this wavelength. So there are many energies of infrared light in between. And so we're irradiating our sample with all of this infrared light of all all of those different wavelengths and so the wave numbers here are the way we differentiate between those uh, individual energies of IR radiation. On this axis we have the transmittance or the percentage of that particular wavelength or that particular wave number rather that reaches the detector. So if we get, if we have information at a hundred percent or near a hundred percent transmittance that means that uh, IR light that corresponds to that wave number is all getting through. It's all getting through the sample. It is not being absorbed by the sample. It's going to make it to the detector. And then where we have peaks here, where we have information, so let's look at this wave number right here. Whatever is going on with, the, with IR light of this particular wave number, it is not making it to the detector. We can see that it has a very low percent transmittance. And if it is not making it to the detector, it is being absorbed by something in the sample. So there is a particular functional group in the molecule that is in the sample that absorbs IR light of that wave number. And that is information that tells us about what kind of bonds are in that compound. So 
Looking across here, we can see that here's some important data, here's some important data, here's some important data. We should note that this region here, around 1500 and, and, and below, is called the fingerprint region. Um, there's some very delicate information there, uh, but it's very complicated to analyze and it goes beyond the scope of this tutorial. So we won't talk about the fingerprint, fingerprint region right now. But what we want to understand is that we have uh, uh, tables. Now, I've only drawn, uh, I've only written three things up here, but there's long tables of every function group that we can imagine in a molecule and we can talk about the particular wave number of IR light that is absorbed by that functional group. So for example, we have the OH, we have the OH sigma bond right here. The OH stretch uh, occurs at this wave number. So if that oxygen hydrogen covalent bond absorbs infrared light of that particular wave number, it will begin to stretch like this. And if it does, if it is irradiated with light of that wave number, it is being absorbed, which means it does not get to the detector. And that's why we see something like this. So we call this the OH stretch. And so what this means in terms of data that we can interpret from an IR spectrum, if there is an OH stretch, there is an OH group in the molecule. That means there is a hydroxyl group somewhere in the molecule. We can look at the spectrum and be very confident that there is a hydroxyl group in this molecule. Now, there's a couple others. We'll just look at the three most basic ones. The next one is called the saturated CH stretch. So the saturated CH stretch means <clears throat> that there is fully saturated uh, carbon uh, bound to a hydrogen, meaning this is not an sp2 carbon, it is not an sp carbon, this is a, this is a carbon, this is a, a, a fully saturated uh, carbon, so it has a maximum bonds to other carbons and hydrogens. And so this carbon-hydrogen bond, if it absorbs IR light of that wave number, it will begin to stretch. And so it's not all making it to the detector, and so that's there. And most organic compounds will give you a saturated C8 stretch because most organic compounds have some saturated carbon-hydrogen bond in it. Okay, and then lastly, let's look at the carbonyl stretch. Now, this may vary depending on whether it is a carbonyl from an aldehyde, ketone, ester, amide, or what have you, but it will generally occur somewhere in this region, and it will look somewhat like this. And so if we have that stretch, we know that there is a carbonyl. Now, the last thing that we want to point out, a very common error, is that um, people will say, well, there's a saturated CH stretch, so that, that dominate, that's the only functional group present in the molecule. Or, or they will say, there's an uh, OH stretch, so there can't be some other functional group. All we are trying to understand is that every functional group in the molecule will be represented on the IR spectrum. So let's just say hypothetically uh, <clears throat> we had a molecule that gave us this spectrum. We would know that there is saturated carbon-hydrogen bonds, we know that there's a hydroxyl group, and we know that there's a carbonyl of some kind. So that could look like anything. It, it doesn't tell us the precise structure of the molecule, but it could look, say, like this. It could have a hydroxyl there, and it could have a carbonyl there. We're not sure, right? It's not telling us the precise structure. But the reason this could be useful is that let's say we do some, uh, we do some uh, reaction and maybe we even know the empirical formula of our product and we know that our, uh, we know that our uh, compound ha has an oxygen atom in it. Well, the reason IR would be useful for that is we would say, what kind of oxygen is it? Is it a hydroxyl oxygen? Is it an ether oxygen? Is it a carbonyl oxygen? And we might get an IR spectrum and know just from that at least what kind of functional group the oxygen is participating in. If we saw an OH stretch, we would say that oxygen must be a hydroxyl oxygen. If that was not present, we would know that it is not, uh, that it is, uh, not a hydroxyl oxygen. So, the main thing that we want to get from this very basic introduction to IR spectroscopy is that functional groups that absorb IR light at specific wave numbers will provide very specific peaks. Not only are they occurring at specific wave numbers, but they have characteristic shapes. The OH has a nice curvy dip like this, the carbonyl is thin and long, and so we can take an IR spectrum and we can know roughly what kind of functional groups are in a molecule. Thanks for watching guys, subscribe to my channel for more tutorials, and as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.